When I left for the 2017 NASA Astrobiology Science Conference, I wasn't sure what to expect. Sure, the theme of the conference was diverse life and its detection on different worlds, so that meant I knew two things. One, I knew that NASA had chosen me and a handful of other people from all around the country to take part, and two, that I'd probably meet many people much more intelligent than I. But here I was, about to board a plane from Ohio to Arizona for a conference which, as excited as I was, I felt I didn't know anything about. Was I going to see some meteorites? Was I going to meet an astronaut? Was I going to become an astronaut? Well, probably not the last one, but I had no idea what I was going to experience. I landed in Phoenix, Arizona on Sunday, the day before the conference. I'd never taken an Uber before, but the process went smoothly, and after dealing with the tiny issue of accidentally leaving my camera at the airport and needing two more Uber rides to get to my hotel, I was in need of a good sleep. Okay, finally back to the hotel, and oh, what a night I've had already. I just want to go into my room, order some pizza, and gorge myself on that before I fall asleep because I have NASA in the morning. So, I think that's what I'm gonna do. The doctor will see you now. The next morning, I dressed up as the doctor, complete with Sonic. I mean, it was a NASA event, and I'm a fan of subtle cosplay. I felt the doctor would want to pop in and see how the space program is going. I'd never been to Arizona before, though it reminded me of California. The trees, the building style, the heat. Since it was so hot and I had made the decision to wear a suit, I made sure to stay hydrated. After wandering around in the conference area, which was actually just an enormous hotel, I finally found my way to the social media group gathering. Yes. We were talking about ourselves and what brought us there, and then it was my turn. I've always been interested in the idea of life on other planets, and I have a bit of a social media following filled with nerdy people. You follow me? So. Really? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I saw your picture, I was like, wait a minute. Wow. That's, that's a very small world. <laughs> I guess so. After being sort of recognized and grabbing some breakfast, it was time for the conference to get underway. Unauthorized live video streaming of present Wait, is that a... That's a Death Star. I, Steve Dash, the conference chair, and... I'm Mary Wojcik, the head of the astrobiology program at NASA. We all... We welcome you. We welcome you. We just keep hearing more and more things that encourage us about our understanding and our, and, and our pursuit of uh, understanding the origin of evolutional life on Earth, when it began, how it evolved, and certainly the possibility for life beyond Earth. There were many presentations, scientists and students alike showing results of research that they had been conducting over years. And when that gets conducted back up into the ocean, it can react with the dissolving cations in the seawater in order to produce a porous precipitate which is our hydrothermal chimney. Like I said, people much smarter than I. But this presenter, his name was Arden Hammer, and he was so passionate about his work that it was so easy to be engaged. Even though, admittedly, some of these presenters said words that I didn't even know were real. And that's something that I quickly realized about this conference. During the plenary talks, there were presenters who were explaining their results as if they were talking to fellow scientists in their field. Probably higher sources directly through the ACF crystals, so we're only selecting a 10 nanometer wide uh, monochromatic but there were also those who were able to present their findings in an accessible science sort of way. So for any of you guys in this room that have worked on origins of life, I think one of the things that's really compelling about that problem is it forces you to think about biology in a totally different way. During our time at the conference, I and others in the NASA social group would discuss just how relatable and accessible a scientist was able to relay their findings, because that is important. Hashtag accessible science. For example, did you know that Mars and other icy worlds in our solar system, such as Europa, one of the moons of Jupiter, have been increasingly recognized as habitable, and that exoplanets in our neighboring universes could possibly support life as well? Side note, an exoplanet is a planet outside of our solar system that orbits a star, some of which could possibly support life. Before the conference, it was announced that scientists had recently discovered seven Earth-like exoplanets orbiting a star dubbed Trappist-1. Three of these exoplanets were right in the Goldilocks zone, 
zone where conditions and temperatures are moderate enough to allow a planet to have watery oceans. Get it? Goldilocks? This distance is too hot. This distance is too cold. This distance is just right. This is Lemur 3. It's a climbing robot from JPL Robotics that can adhere to a variety of surfaces. In this video, it's climbing a 90 degree rock formation in New Mexico, which is incredible. And then it was lunchtime. Now I enjoy trying new things. So when I'm visiting somewhere far away from what I'm used to, I like to eat somewhere that I've never been. Take a chance on the local cuisine, experience the world. So my team decided on Jimmy John's. Right, Jimmy John's, the chain. Oh well, it wasn't that big of a deal. I was with people I'd never met before in a place I'd never been before doing something I had never done before. So I was fine with some familiarity. Thank there you. you go, sir. Napkins right there. By the way, I got the bootlegger. Bootlegger all the way. Coming back from lunch, I realized, sure, I was in the Arizona heat and I was wearing many layers, but I was clearly the best dressed of my group. And you know what else I found out? I was the only YouTuber in the NASA social group. I was the only one filming anything. Everyone else was taking pictures, taking notes, taking mental notes. But you know what? That's fine. It just means that I'll have the best video of the group. I should probably talk about why we're on a train now. So the NASA social group left the conference to hop a train to visit Arizona State University. There were a lot of skateboarders out that day. I feel like this is a skateboarding street and we're not supposed to walk here. ASU School of Earth and Space Exploration, where the ground floor was basically a museum. Welcome to the School of Earth and Space Exploration. We have a great, uh, fun-packed hour or so for you. Uh, I know you're all social media people, so you'll be doing all sorts of things with your devices, which is fine. And that was amazing because they were allowing us to tour the meteorite vault, something that's not open to the public. Yes, yeah. you'll be glad you did. You can't take that into the vault, by the way. Thank you. Great, thank uh -huh. you. Their Center for Meteorite Studies has the largest university-based meteorite collection in the entire world. Big ones, small ones, some as big as your, well, most of them were really small. I mean, they have over 40,000 individual specimens, so they can't all be as big as your head. It's a research collection, so please touch uh, it. Do not. <laughs> ha, NASA Social's got jokes. The vault is a dedicated, state-of-the-art meteorite curation facility where most of the university's collection is stored. So when I was saying we have over 40,000 different specimens, in this tray there's 557 stones, 745, and 424. inside the meteorite is as cold as it was in space. Um, there are other accounts of people walking up to meteorites that actually have condensation on them, they actually have frost on them, and people touching them and said that they were burned, but not because it was hot, because it was so cold, it was like some, grabbing something in your freezer. Something else interesting that I learned is that meteorites are made up of the same elements as we find on Earth. Meteorites contain unique minerals which are uncommon on Earth, but no new element has ever been identified in a meteorite. And then we got to do something pretty amazing. We got to touch Mars. You go and I can tell your friends to touch Mars. Hear that, guys? I touched Mars. Mama, we made it. Thank you. Yeah. Then we visited the Ronald Greeley Center for Planetary Studies, which houses an extensive library of images, maps, and mission documentation from all major U.S. spacecraft missions. I'm Professor David Williams. I'm an associate research professor at the School of Earth and Space Exploration, and I am the director of the facility. These cabinets over here have the actual images, some of the images from the Apollo missions, as well as uh, back over there. We 
were treated to a demonstration by what's known as a magic planet. It creates a digital display on a spherically shaped globe and the image can be changed with the touch of a button. This is Lo, the innermost moon of Jupiter and the most volcanically active body in our solar system. Now watch this. Isn't that neat? So we have this one continent-sized region that sticks up here, Vestalia Terra. We think this is a piece of the original crust of asteroid 4 Vesta. Here's the snowman craters here. The big one at the base is uh, Marcia or Marcia. All the craters on, on Vesta have to be named after Vestal virgins or famous Roman women. Uh, when that one was named first, uh, Marcia, I wanted to name the others Jan and Cindy. Ha! Professor Williams got jokes. Unfortunately, there weren't any Vestal virgins with those names. We were leaving to go back to the conference, and I got to talking with Lead Communication Specialist, Planetary Science Division at NASA, Lori Cantilla. I was just showing her how to vlog, no big deal. Hire me, please. And I just had to ask to take a selfie with her. And then we met up with former NASA astronaut, Hubble Space Telescope repairman, and all-around great guy, John Grunsfeld. For the first time ever, we have to take around and answer that question. Uh, because we have issues to Mars and Volta, maybe in some other And to top it off, the Hubble Space Telescope was launched 27 years ago to the day, so we just had to say... One, two, three... Happy birthday, Hubble! <laughs> and of course, I had to ask to take a selfie with such a legend. And just like that, my first day of the conference was over. Some of us cool kids went to dinner, and I realized these really are my people. Basically an astronaut right now. Met, met one. The next day I was on the road bright and early, not nearly as early as day one, but just as bright. This day though, I opted for short sleeves. Alright, there you go. Thank I you very much. Go through there or over this That's way. fine, I know where I'm going. Okay. Thanks Uber Driver, but this isn't my first rodeo. I'm with NASA Social. As the NASA social team started regrouping in the morning, we found beautiful space-inspired artwork scattered throughout the conference halls. Here we have a carbon-filled Martian meteorite that fell in 1963. Right here in Arizona. One day and she's already an expert. Such an inspiration. This was another one of my favorite presenters, Dr. Lee Cronin. He spoke about artificial evolution in a chemical robot with configurable environments. The message I want to kind of start with is thinking, what did life look like before there was life? Well, that's a clearly a crazy question. You just have an environment. But really, the emergence of biology has something to do with taking the environment and putting it into a container. So you have kind of increasing evolution. And this is kind of an interesting idea because at the beginning there was no biology, there were no cells. So how do we suddenly shape the environment and out pops some biology? Basically attempting to create an inorganic cell to explore how life arose out of inorganic dead stuff. Now this is very contrived. Before you get up and say that's not a life form, it's a robot making salad dressing. Yeah, it is. <laughs> um, <laughs> But the point is to see if we can um, show that through selection and uh, propagation we can do some kind of evolutionary experiment. And after his talk, I of course had to ask him for a selfie. I guess he doesn't take many selfies. Then it was about time for lunch and I was not going to settle for Jimmy John's. So Geo, one of the NASA social locals, knew exactly where we should eat but that place was closed. So we went to the next best place, authentic Mexican. So I ordered the most authentic thing on the menu. Can I get the super nachos and a piece of cheesecake? Look at Gio's face. Yeah, that's right. I ordered cheesecake with my super nachos. I just didn't realize how super those nachos were going to be. I mean, look at this thing. I'm pretty sure it's for sharing between three people, but this, this was all mine. 
After we got back to the conference, we listened to a few more people talk about possible explorer missions to places like Europa, which was very interesting. This is how this particular rover will be able to take unexposed samples and then actually do analysis inside of itself. As the NASA social experience was winding down, we were asked for feedback by the organizers and my new buddy Jarrett had a surprising response. I realized that there was so much going on between like astrobiology, geology, chemistry, physics, and all that. And so before I came here, I wanted to go to medical school. After a two days here, uh -oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> uh -oh. no, no more of that. Now I want to what? A PhD in biology, astrobiology, whatever I have to, wow. and I want to be a part of it. Oh my gosh. Any way, shape, or form. So, <laughs> we took one last photo together. Okay, one last photo. I. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm covering Brian's face. It was at this point that the conference was kind of over for some of our NASA social group. Half of our team decided to head out, but a few of us were still experiencing. Wait, 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 look at this guy. Doesn't he look like John Hammond from Jurassic Park? That's better. Remember earlier when I was talking about accessible science? This girl was a prime example. Her name is Alyssa Adams, and she's using League of Legends as an analog for evolution. The game developer, also known as Riot, they're external, they measure some sort of thing inside the game. They're paying attention to what the players are doing, and they go, hey, you know what? We're gonna make changes to the game constraints based on what the players are doing. So they update the game, and they change these constraints. This is a lot like biology, because you have the organisms or some sort of living thing, and they go through and they explore their environment, and something happens, and the environment is changed based on what the organisms or players are doing. How neat is that? I don't play League, but I was able to follow along and understand exactly what she was talking about. Hashtag accessible science. And as our slightly smaller group was sitting in on the final plenary talk of the day, it finally hit me that this adventure was coming to a close. This wonderful experience with my awesome group, the talks, the education, the memories. Soon this crowd will leave, and then I'll have to leave but not before going out to dinner once more. With our group down to five people, we decided to eat out one more time. I hope this time we get to go somewhere new, like, oh, Logan's? All right, I'm, I'm fine with that. And as I looked around the table, I realized just how many new friends I made on this trip. And I don't just mean Lori Cantillo. Seriously, Lori, get in touch with me about a job. But I mean Amy, Chris, Brian, Sarah, Jarrett, Kelly, Caitlin, and the rest of the group. Our NASA social group worked so well because it was such a great assortment of amazing people from all around the country, even if some of us can't eat steak properly. So as we said our goodbyes and our see you laters and I headed back to Ohio the next day, it, it was real. I was leaving. This trip, without a doubt, helped me broaden my perspective by visiting a new state for a few days, and of course, talking about humanity's plans to visit new planets. Are you my Uber? I'm your Uber! Hey, hey. Hey. I swear, this place is full of people who have never picked up anybody at a freaking airport before. By the way, this is my buddy Pat. He's not my Uber. He's just a good friend picking me up at the airport. Oh my god, what are you doing there? You think you have any less? Though it seems he may have some slight road rage. Thank you so much to everyone who helped me get to Arizona on such short notice, and thank you to those in NASA who chose me to be part of the NASA social team. It was a wonderful experience, I can't wait to do it again. And finally, thank you to the rest of the NASA social team. You guys made this such a fun experience, and I hope to see all of you soon. The universe is waiting for you. All you have to do is reach out and explore, and make sure to try the local cuisine, like a Jimmy John's.
I'm only waiting on you to take this final epic shot. <laughs> I think it's the final epic shot of us leaving the conference.